today we're going to be doing a little bit of ether, history of ether, and what you'll find out is that it parallels very closely, you know, the uh, history of gravity that we did last week. So if you look at that, uh, ether was used as the medium for gravity, but primarily for light. Okay, so all this really go, ties in together. And the interesting thing, what, what you're going to find out today, is that nothing has changed in the last 10,000 years. They are still using the ether, okay, to this day. Nothing has changed, and the ether has not changed a bit. I mean, they've given it different characteristics, uh, different properties, uh, but it's always been the same. Bunch of particles. It's never changed. And anyone who says anything different, well, all they have to do is tell it. Show us in the record where it says that the ether is anything other than a bunch of particles. That's one issue. And then the other one is, okay, so you think ether is something else? Hey, if it's a thing, illustrate it. If it's a concept, define it. Very simple. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the history of the ether. Where, where did this ether come from and why has it been, why have we never gotten rid of it? Because the ether is still alive today, as we will see, right? Okay, uh, the ether probably preceded these two fellows, okay? But they, they are, they are uh, credited with really discussing the ether in, to some uh, degree uh, early on, to an analyzing and that kind of thing, you know? And so we have Plato on the left and Aristotle on the right, the two Greek guys. And uh, so how did they uh, visualize the ether? Well, uh, I cannot tell you exactly that, how, that this is the way they saw it, but uh, they really uh, thought that the ether pervaded everything, you know, in the universe. Except that um, maybe this is not completely correct because the way they looked at it is the ether was not here on Earth. It was out there, like, giving kind of a background to, uh, to the universe or to the solar system, at least, you know, the, their notion of the universe. So if you look at Airy, you know, Airy comes a, a few years later after uh, Plato, and he devised this world in which the uh, Earth was really at the center, the uh, sun was rolling around <laughs> the Earth, right? And uh, what happened? Well, the ether was outside of at least our solar system, if not outside our universe, you know? So he thought it, saw it as all these particles like air that were, uh, that. Uh, was what the uh, uh, the gods breathed, okay? So it was uh, what they breathed, not what we breathe. We breathe air, they breathe ether. And the ether was obviously responsible for all that stuff that we could not explain. And in such a way, they, you know, uh, essentially put it uh, way past anybody's uh, ability to visualize it. They said, it sits out there, you know, don't bother me. <laughs> it was more or less like that. Okay, so uh, so uh, where do we go from there? Well, uh, what it was used for primarily was for this. Here you have the flat earth model, okay? You have the sun rolling around the flat earth. Uh, a lot of people believed in that for some time. But even when with a flat model, right, a flat earth model, uh, they had this ether in its background. You know, they, they always thought it was the ether that somehow had something to do with the... Uh, sun with the movement of stars, etc. Not so much the stars because they were too far away and they thought they were still, but yeah, with everything that they could see moving in our solar system, like, you know, the planets and so on. Well, from this, uh, they, some, some of the more enlightened people out there, you know, they figured out the, uh, what is known today as the Ptolemaic system of epicycles. It looks more or less like this. Okay, so uh, you had all these, uh, uh, planets, uh, and including the sun, moving around the Earth, okay? But uh, again, uh, you know, this uh, model uh, also had the ether in the background, okay? So this is the way they visualize. They say, yeah, what's moving all this stuff is the ether, or this stuff is moving through the ether, okay? So they had no problem with imagining it like that, and they just left it at that because they said, we'll never figure it out. And we're still there today, right? <laughs> A lot of these people say, we'll never figure it out, how this universe works even though, like I said, it's uh, kindergarten stuff. Okay, and so here's the model that came uh, afterwards, uh, the one from Kepler and um, 
Tycho Brahe and other people, astronomers slash astrologers, they did a little bit of everything. Uh, but even their model, you know, consisted of this ether model where the uh, ether was in the background. Okay, so um, this is how they imagined it because the ether had not gone away and the ether was all these bunch of particles that were in the background. This is the way they visualized or imagined it. They didn't know what the ether was, but they said there's got to be something there. And then uh, the only issue that really came up with all these people were the properties of the ether. So they, start, they started pondering, you know, what kind of properties does this medium have? Is it an ocean of what? And so they imagined it as particles. Okay, and the only thing that came to their mind, all these loose particles. Um, and you have someone like uh, Descartes, René Descartes, and he was a big man in his days. He was well respected uh, for many years, even after his death. And so he was like, you know, the Einstein of his age, so to speak. And he had uh, these, um, these little spirals, these vortices, okay? And uh, that's what he proposed the ether was. He had this particle notion, but he had them swirling around in, um, in these spirals, right? And so René said the following, he says, there is no such thing as a void or vacuum. He didn't believe in space, just like Aristotle did not believe that there was such a thing as empty space. He just said, when something moves, something else takes its place. And the question is, how can it move if it doesn't have space to move into? And they said, well, it just replaces another object. And so he equates the ether with space. Okay? This medium fills space completely, except for tiny separations between the vortices. Yeah, and uh, he, he downplayed that, but that's a, an extremely important part of his uh, fake uh, uh, hypothesis. Because, you know, how do you separate one vortice, uh, vortex from another? What's between the vort vortices? And it never occurred to him that you have, if there's a separation, something has to be separating those two vortices. And it just never clicked on him. Now, he's, he visualizes it like an ocean, right? The disturbance we call light is a, st a statical pressure in this medium. I like that statical pressure. You know, I thought pressure was movement, but he's got a static one, right? And so ether is the medium of light. So they had the ether itself vibrating somehow. In his case, it was vortices. And that was light. Light was just uh, vibrations of the ether. And he says, uh, vortices in this ether are responsible for the accumulation of the particles that form matter and shape solid objects. So the objects themselves are eventually made of ether itself, right? He postulates a vortex of fluid matter around magnets, and matter of the vortex enters one pole and leaves the other, okay? Uh, how that produces attraction or repulsion, we don't know, but that's how he imagined it, okay? And this is how he uh, made his presentation. And he was considered, like I said, a big man. He, he was the Einstein of his age. He was well respected by a lot of these folks. A few years later, we have this other fellow. His name is Robert Boyle. And he uh, studied vacuum. <laughs> Charles II would say that, you know, I'm paying all this money and this guy is studying what? Air? <laughs> because he, he was very uh, fond of vacuum, uh, the uh, vacuum chambers, right? So he worked a lot with that. And he was also uh, head of the Royal Society. In fact, uh, he was really the main man who created it. And he says the ether also, you know, he believed in the ether. A diffused and very subtle substance consisting of what? Subtle particles. There you have it, folks. Subtle particles. There is always in the air a swarm of streams moving in a determinate course between the North Pole and the South Pole. Okay, so he had this, these particles flowing essentially, you know, from one region of the earth to the other. That was his notion. But in between, we had these uh, other fellows. Uh, this saw his name was Robert Hooke, and he was really the lab boy for Robert Bo uh, for Boyle, okay? And uh, Boyle, uh, Hooke was a fellow that uh, really investigated the ether and wrote about it quite a bit, one of the first to write about it. And again, the reason you see a question mark there is that Newton hated Hooke's guts. And when uh, Newton took over the Royal Society after Hooke's death, he destroyed everything that Hooke made. In fact, uh, even his pictures. So we don't have a picture of Robert Hooke today. You'll find pictures on the internet, but uh, 
uh, they don't know if that's him, and more than likely it's not. Newton made sure that nobody ever saw Robert Hooke again. <laughs> and this is what Hooke said. He said, the light is not propagated through air in straight lines. He said, it's uh, Andre. He's the guy who discovers the wave nature of light. Really, he's, he's the guy who really starts with that. He said, there is some illumination within the uh, geometrical shadow of an opaque body. So he had this notion of diffraction. Uh, that came from Grimaldi, not from him, but he, he picked up on that, right? So he said, you know, the only way we can explain that is with waves. So he's really the wave guy, but he was thinking of longitudinal waves, right? And uh, he, he continues, he says, discovers the wave nature of light, okay? Transitional from Descartes' system of vortices to a fully developed theory of undulations. So uh, he, he did not agree, in fact, with uh, Descartes because... Um, uh, Robert Hooke did not believe that light had a mediator, that there was a medium for light. He said it's the same um, ether that is vibrating, that is, it, which is everywhere, but uh, when it vibrates locally, that's what we call light. Okay? He attacks the Cartes uh, theory that light is a tendency to motion rather than actual motion, and he specifies there is no luminous body. Okay? And listen to that. He says there is no body but has the parts of it in motion, meaning the ether. He's saying the ether is what is moving. There is no special body that mediates light. That was the notion. And he says, some bodies shine for a considerable time without being wasted away. Therefore, whatever is in motion is not permanently lost to the body. So the body, when it loses light, he says, it doesn't lose anything. It doesn't lose any mass, essentially. That's what he was saying. So if it doesn't lose any mass, well, uh, it's not getting rid of any, anything which is material. That's, that was his notion. That was his reasoning. Ether motion must be of a vibratory character, meaning waves, right? And Hook charged Newton with, hot, with holding the doctrine that light is a material substance. And Newton later on denied that he wasn't willing to stick his neck out because he said, look, I'm not interested in all that stuff. But, he, but Hook really accused him of that. One of the reasons they uh, argued a lot and fought a lot, okay? And, uh, but anyways, Hook continues with the ether. Now he's going to give you some properties of the ether. He says, ether must be a transparent, homogeneous uh, body, susceptible to and capable of imparting motion. Okay? So the ether is not only uh, malleable, but it can impart motion in okay? both. The constitution and motion of the parts must be such uh, that a pulse of the luminous body may be communicated or propagated through it to the greatest imaginable distance, right? Because light was so fast, right? In the least imaginable time, although not in an instant. Okay? So that's what, that's the, he's talking about the properties of the ether. That's his ether, right? Motion is propagated in every direction through this homogeneous uh, medium with equal velocity by direct or straight rays extending radially from the center of a sphere. Hey, there's our model. You know, you have all these rays coming out of a sphere, right? The atom, it's got all these uh, threads sticking outwards in every direction of the universe. So he more or less uh, figured that one out, but he didn't come up with our model of our atom, right? Every pulse or vibration of the luminous body will generate an expanding sphere like waves or rings on the surface of the water. Okay, so this was his notion. And again, he's the first person really to propose the wave nature of light. He had a microscope. He was looking there. He saw rings. He said, that's not particles. That's waves. Okay? That looks like uh, throwing a stone in the water and having all these ripples move. Uh, away from ground zero. That's more or less what he visualized light as. And of course, then came his nemesis, Mr. Newton, and he said all space is permeated by an elastic medium or ether. So they all believed in the ether. Every single one in the 17th century, they all thought there was this ether, this ocean out there, and that's what they uh, charged with uh, being uh, the uh, medium that created light, gravity, and who knows what else which is capable of propagating vibrations in the same way as the air propagates the vibration of sound, but with far greater velocity, okay? This ether pervades the pores of all material bodies. So far, they're all pretty much, you know, on the same page, right? Ether causes the cohesion 
of material bodies. Ether density varies from one body to another, being greater, gr greatest in the free interplanetary spaces. Okay, so he says there's a lot of ether between us and the moon. It is not necessarily a single uniform substance. Air contains water vapor, hence the ether may contain what? Ethereal spirits. <laughs> So we have spirits out there. We're introducing the, uh, the soul and the, who knows what, the angels. Produces phenomena such as electricity, magnetism, and gravitation. Light does not consist of vibrations of the ether, uh, quite unlike Hooke. You can see there he criticized Hooke for that. And remember, Newton was the newcomer, so Hooke was saying, well, who's this kid who tells me that it's not the vibration of the ether? And that's when they began their fighting. And he says, light is something of a different kind that lucid bodies propagate. Okay, so, so Newton was uh, the idea that light did have a mediator, whereas uh, Hooke did not. Hooke said it's the vibration of the ether. And that's gonna be the fight for the next couple centuries. You know, is there a mediator for light or is there not? And some people say, yes, yeah, the ether, the ether itself, which is everything in the universe because it's just a bunch of particles and it's vibrating here. And we call that little vibration there the light or whatever you want to call it and uh, the other said no no there's something that's moving through the ether so those were the two general notions that we have out there for like two or three centuries at least since the 17th century and here he continues that some etherists suppose this is interesting because it shows that newton didn't give a damn about all this stuff he he he, he wanted to describe it mathematically he did not want to explain it or give you causes or mechanisms so he says, some etherists propose the ether to consist of an aggregate of various peripatetic qualities. Other theorists suppose it to be comprised of unimaginably small corpuscles of various sizes. Ether initially accelerates these particles until the resistance of the ethereal medium equals the force of the, uh, that, accelerate, uh, that accelerated them. Much like bodies that fall in water are accelerated until the resistance of the water equals the force of gravity. Okay, so you can see what he's talking about there. He's saying you throw, uh, I don't know, uh, your uh, lifesaver into the water. It doesn't sink. It's pushed up by the water. And that's more or less what he's saying. But here's, here's the interesting part from Newton. It says, to avoid dispute <laughs> and make the hypothesis general, let every man here take his fancy. Just, you know, think whatever you want. Only whatever light be, I suppose it consists of rays differing from one another in contingent circumstances, as bigness, form, or vigor. In any case, light and ether are capable or mutual interaction. So we have, so he's saying light is something different than the ether. That's the first thing. And then they, uh, obviously there must be something because they can interact, right? Ether is in fact the intermediary, in intermediary between light and ponderable matter. And so he's saying light is something, and that's what uh, Hook was criticizing. And yeah, so we have a difference here. Either the ether is, uh, light is the vibration of the ether, or there's something moving through the ether, separate from the ether, which we call light. And Newton uh, favored the latter, and championed the latter. Okay, for the 17th century, we can just put a couple more here real quick. Uh, one is Torricelli, who said, light is transmitted as readily through a vacuum as through air. He did not know that uh, there was a refractive index. At the time, it seemed to him that it all had the same speed through any medium, right? Which it does, by the way. Uh, light always travels at 300,000 kilometers per second under the rope model, okay? It's uh, refracted and diffracted. It's, uh, it just moves from atom to atom along the ropes. So there is no difference in speed of light. It always travels at the same speed. I can't say everywhere in the universe because I don't know what's out there on the edges of the universe, but uh, for the main part of the universe, I would say light travels always at the same speed. And then here you have uh, Huygens, and he says uh, the medium of ether, he picks up on Torricelli's comment, right? And he says the medium of ether in which propagation takes place must penetrate all matter and be present even in all so-called Vacua. So he, he did not believe, Huygens, that, um, that uh, there's any space without ether. Okay? And again, the problem that all these people had is that when you say that, what is the ether? If, if it's a bunch of particles as they all imagine them, what separates one particle from the other? What is there between two particles of ether? 
You know, the ether is the whole ocean, and it's made out of all these particles. Something must separate one particle from the other. You got to identify that something. If they're round, you got even bigger problem. I mean, if they're cubic, no problem because, uh, or not as much problem because at least one block is next to the other block. But if they're separated, something is between them separating them. Otherwise, it'd be a single block. You know, the block universe, <laughs> the real block universe. But if, um, if they're separated and if they're roundish, well, then you're in big trouble because now you have these interstices and you got to explain to us, you know, what is that stuff there? Uh, empty space? No, I thought you said space did not exist. So this is the problem. This is where they really screwed up badly. Okay. okay uh, so uh, that was the 17th century. Took a couple more centuries for these people to get their act more or less together. And the first guy to come up really at the very beginning of the uh, 19th century, 1801 to 1803, we have Thomas Young, and he is going to try to destroy Newton. Not, not because he hates Newton, but because he says, look, you know, I think Newton was not really correct. And he was, <laughs> he was trying to criticize, you know, Newton, who was this big name out there. So he had to be very careful. And he goes out there and he says, look, you know, um, uh, uh, I believe in the, that light is really a wave of some kind, you know, that uh, of some kind. He could not imagine what it could be, you know, but he says it's some kind of wave because, look, I, I do the slit experiment and I get this uh, interference pattern. And he says that can only be explained with waves. You cannot explain this with light, uh, with uh, particles. If it were corpuscles, as Newton called them, right, uh, you would have only two lines on the screen, you know, which are the two lines in the slit. Okay, in the double slit. And so uh, he said, no, this, this has to be some kind of interference pattern produced by waves. And this changes the uh, ball game because now everybody in the uh, 19th century, right, begins talking about waves. And what is it that's waving? Again, we have the ether. <laughs> but what, eth what, what, are, what is it that's waving? Is it the ether? Is it something that's going through the ether? And people wanted to think it was the ether itself, but they never really put their finger on what is the ether. Because if, you, if, if ether is the medium, whether it's, you know, if it's vibrating, it's uh, undulating, it's uh, waving, then the, the medium is ether. So you do have to identify, you have to tell me what the ether is if you're going to wave it. You know, I mean, if, if I wave a flag, right, I have to have a flag. I can't say, look, I'm waving and the flag. And you say, well, where's the flag? Uh, I forgot it. <laughs> no, no, here's the flag. You got to show the flag and then you can wave it. And they don't do that with the ether. They say it's the uh, waving of the ether. And of course, everybody in the back of their minds had there. It's a bunch of particles, but nobody specified that specifically. Nobody really put their finger on that. You have to identify the objects in physics. And what happened was this. In 1818, 1818, there was a little contest in France, okay? And uh, the issue came around because uh, they wanted to explain um, the wave nature of light. And the guy who appears is Fresnel, uh, Fresnel. And uh, he comes in there and he says, look, I can explain it. And he has this picket fence mechanism where he says, look, uh, looks like light has to be a transverse wave. It's not a longitudinal wave as Huygens and uh, Hooke and all these other people thought. No, it's, it's a transverse wave and that changes everything because he says, look, what you have here is uh, like a picket fence. You know, if the picket is standing up, up and down, right? And you send the, uh, uh, what is it? The uh, wave, the transverse wave. What the picket fence does is eliminate or prevent the horizontal component of the transverse wave, it stops that and allows only the other one to go through. And with that, he was able to explain some things and a lot of people liked it, except one guy, and his name was Poisson, okay? And there you have the picket fence mechanism that Fresnel proposed. Poisson, he comes in there, he says, look, you're full of it. You know, he was a very fan uh, guy who, a great fan of uh, Newton's, and so he, he said, no, a light is a bunch of particles. And so Poisson just speculates, he theorizes that if Fresnel is right, if he's correct, I can prove that he's, he's going to die, he's, he's wrong. And I'll tell you why, because if he's correct, there should be a little dot, a little bright spot in the center of, um, you know, if you have an obstacle there, 
uh, you know, the light should be able to go around that and converge upon that point, around the obstacle and converge upon a point, we should see a little bright dot. And it turns out he wanted to destroy Fresnel's theory by using this uh, thought experiment. It turns out that uh, Arago, uh, Francois Arago, he goes in there, he does the experiment, and uh, that's why it should be called maybe the Arago uh, <laughs> uh, uh, spot instead of the Poisson spot, and some people do call it the Arago uh, spot. And he showed that indeed there was a dot in the center right behind the obstacle. And so they, he gave the prize to Fresnel and said, hey, this guy won because uh, he really showed that light does have wave characteristics. It turns out that uh, later on when he looked up uh, the history books, he found out that this other guy, the Lille, uh, he, was, he had already proven that, uh, the spot, uh, like 100, almost 100 years earlier. And so it should be called the Lille spot. And I'm not sure which of these names is easier to pronounce. <laughs> So, uh, you know, uh, the issue was that uh, they had this wave nature and then the wave nature was grounded in stone for the rest of the 19th century until the end of the century, obviously. And so what were they talking about? They said, well, it's uh, this luminiferous uh, ether, okay? And uh, light is just, uh, it's just a vibration of that ether. They had this ether just flowing through the solar system in this, in this example, right? And so they said, well, how can we prove the existence of the ether? Again, they were trying to say that there's something out there, and that's what light is. Okay, we've shown, we've uh, proven it through uh, the slit experiment. We know it's a wave. We know the Poisson spot exists, etc. So how do we uh, show that it's out there in the, uh, in the solar system, that we have all this ether flowing through us? And so they had this notion, as you can see, it's made out of a bunch of particles, right? and they're all moving across the solar system. That's what the arrows indicate at the bottom. So this was their notion. Okay, this is what everybody thought the ether was, and really nothing had changed. Uh, or we can say something has changed. Some of them saw the ether as something static, uh, what I call a sandbox. And the Earth was moving through the sandbox. And everything was still, and the only thing moving were the planets and everything else through a sandbox. And that didn't work very well. So people say, no, it's dynamic. It sometimes moves, sometimes it doesn't. And so they started looking at the properties of the ether. And one fellow, his name is George Stokes, and he was um, uh, head of the uh, Royal Society, so he pulled his weight, right? And he came with the entrainment theory. And <laughs> I like how he cheats. He said, the ether is a fluid at slow speeds and rigid at fast speeds. He wanted to cover all the bases. He says, I need both. <laughs> Thus, the Earth can move through the ether fairly freely because it's a fluid, but ether would be rigid enough to support light. Because in order to, um, to do light, they said, in order to have a standing wave or a transverse wave, you know, you, you, you need to have a rigid, a rigid medium, a rigid mediator. So they said, well, is the ether fluid or is it rigid? And so here, let me show you something here. You know, if I, if I have a string, you know, I want to run a, uh, a standing wave, you know, See if I can do this right, something like that. <laughs> well, anyways, uh, what's the problem? Well, they said this has to be rigid in order to do that. But I'm saying more than rigid, you need something else. And that never crossed their minds. And that is, you need to have it tied at the other end. You know, try to do this with your uh, clothesline, right? If you don't tie it at the other end, this is what you get. <laughs> you get an old man's, uh, well, you know. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> You need to have a tide at the other end. They never figure this out, that you need this. You need to have a tide at the other end. They said, we need it rigid. You need something more than that. You need to tie it at the other end. Otherwise, you can't do this. So you can only run a standing wave or a transverse wave, not if you send it in one way, you know, like a bunch of particles or who knows what a wave is. No, if you want to send it forward, you need to have it attached. The mediator has to be attached at the other end. And they never realized this, okay? That everything, every atom in the universe has to be connected. There's no other way. Okay, here we have Max, good old Max. And uh, what did Maxwell say? Well, he was a guy who said, hey, you need a mediator. And Newton was also a, a guy who said, you need a mediator for gravity or light, but he didn't know what it was. He just simulated it with particles. And yeah, you can't explain light or gravity with one-way particles. And so here's a uh, good old Max. He said, there appears to be in the minds of these eminent men some prejudice 
or a prior a, a objection against the hypothesis of a medium in which the phenomena of radiation of light and heat and the electric action at a distance take place. The existence of a medium in which light is propagated. He says there is, you know, this prejudice. They were against it, many of these people. Whenever uh, energy is transmitted from one body to another in time, energy transmitted, how do you transmit energy? There must be a medium. Nobody ever realized that you need a medium, you need a thing, you need an object. And then nobody ever realized this. That's, that's what's incredible. Or substance in which the energy exists after it leaves one body before it reaches the other. Absolutely. You need a mediator. I don't care if you put a string, but you need a, 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 a mediator between two objects, two atoms in this case. So James Maxwell at least realized that, but he couldn't figure out what it was because he was thinking of see and touch. It says, I can't see this mediator, I can't touch it, uh, but there has to be one, otherwise we're all crazy. And he did not understand what, what he was saying, what's coming out of his mouth. Yes, you need a mediator. And to this day, we have no mediators. They have concepts in, in uh, mathematical physics. They do everything with concepts. Electric universe does the same thing. Etherists do the same thing. They want to do it all with concepts. No, you need a physical object. You need a dog. You need a couch. You need a, a tree. You need a dog. You need a chain. You need some kind of object. You can't do it with field and energy and mass and time. You can't use concepts as mediators which is what they do. They say, oh, we bent time and I transferred the energy and, uh, you know, the field is vibrating. Can't do, you can't talk like that in physics. That's irrational physics. Okay, and uh, so this is what they came up with, the transverse wave, a good old uh, Max came up with this. And you can see why they confused the rope with that because uh, they, they thought it was waves moving from A to B and nothing was really moving. It's a rope torquing in place. And you can see the, uh, it's got a wave, it's, it's already got a wave nature. All you have to do is twirl it, and then you have the wave, the torsion wave, not a transverse wave. And obviously, a uh, torsion wave, if we, we're going to talk about waves, torsion wave is much, much faster. I mean, infinitely times faster than the, um, than the transverse wave, or a longitudinal wave, for that matter. Okay, so torsion wave beats anything. It's the fastest thing that you can imagine because it doesn't go anywhere, you know? So the signal travel, I mean, you can try this at home. Just go to your clothesline, twist it a little bit with a couple of uh, clothespins at each end, and the other one moves instantaneously, essentially. Okay, and there you can see why uh, velocity of light is equal to frequency times wavelength. The, um, we're talking about links of the rope. The more uh, links you have per meter unit, uh, unit length, right? Uh, the more you have, uh, the more links you have per unit length, the uh, uh, few, the smaller, the shorter the links are, and vice versa. So it's very straightforward, and that's why you know the velocity of light is always a constant. That's why c is always three hundred thousand kilometers per second. It, it better not change, otherwise we're all crazy. Okay, here we have uh, a little later. We have uh, good old Lorentz, and uh, this uh, his equation really existed. The v over c that they use, squared, right? Uh, that already came around, he didn't come up with that. Uh, that. That was already there before him, but he used it to uh, prove that when you move through the ether, right, uh, length contracts. Einstein did not come up with that. You know, Einstein was still in uh, shorts, he was a kid, when Lawrence came up with that. And here you see, uh, he's uh, saying, there's a stationary medium made of countless particles, obviously, right? known as the ether, okay, a stationary medium. The Earth moves through this sandbox, right? Electromagnetic waves also travel through the medium. Speed of light, uh, little c, is constant in all directions, and objects uh, contrast, uh, contract and time dilates as they move through the ether. How did he come up with all that nonsense? Well, there you see the Lorentz factor, as it's called, that gamma. And uh, the real, the crucial part is the v squared over c squared. V squared being the velocity of the object, the closer it approaches the speed of light, the more that approaches one, V over C, I mean, if those two numbers are exactly the same, 300,000 kilometers per second, then you have one, you have one minus one, that's zero, square root of zero is, guess what, it's zero, and one over zero is what? Well, you figure it out. So um, that's, the, that's how he comes up with this notion that uh, there is an ether, you know, because he was trying to, 
explain the results of the Michelson Morley experiment. That's experiments with us, right? They did a couple at least. And they said, look, there is no ether. And so he said, no, no, there has to be an ether. What do you mean there's no ether? And so let me prove to you that there's an ether. He said, ah, I know why you, you uh, uh, didn't uh, notice any change because your apparatus, your, your equipment shrunk. <laughs> it shrunk in the direction of motion. Okay? And that's how they came up with that V. That's why V over C, that little uh, uh, factor, is so important in uh, mathematical physics. Okay, so, and Einstein picked up on that as well, but Einstein had a different notion of the ether. He did have an ether. In fact, he wrote a book about it. Uh, there you see it, the ether, uh, the relativity uh, theory, okay? And he said, uh, the following, he says, uh, we may say that according to the general theory of relativity, space is endowed with physical qualities. Okay, space has physical qualities. It's not, it's not nothing, it is something. In this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. According to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. And he gave that uh, lecture over there in 1920 at the uh, University of Leiden. And uh, yeah, he believed in the ether, but he had a different notion of the ether than Lorentz. And the, really the only difference was that in the case of Lorentz, he, um, he used the ether as a reference. Whereas Einstein said, look, in relativity, everything is relative. <laughs> there is no reference point. You can't put a stake and say, I'm going to measure my, my distance with respect to that. Okay? And so uh, that's where they differ. But the ether was the ether was the ether. And the ether never changed. One just said, look, it's static. The other guy said, it's dynamic. This one says, you can't use it as a reference. The other one says, you can't. The other guy said, I'm going to give it properties of both worlds. I'm going to cover all the bases. I'm going to make sure it's rigid and it's also malleable. And they had all these contradictions because they couldn't figure out what light or gravity are. Okay? That's where the problem was. So where are we today with the ether? Well, here we'll have a Nobel Prize tell us. <laughs> okay, here's the Nobel Prize. If he, does, he can't tell you, nobody can. Okay, here it is. And that's uh, Robert Laughlin. He says, the modern concept of the vacuum of space confirmed every day by experiment is a relativistic what? Ether. I said the word, four-letter word. A relativistic ether, but we do not call it this because it is taboo. Okay, so please don't call it the ether because you're going to offend all the uh, etherists that belong in the, uh, uh, you know, in uh, mathematical physics. They all believe in the ether. They've always had it. And here, in fact, uh, let's illustrate it. What the hell? Let's let's illustrate. Here's the ether for you, folks. Ether from quantum, and it's the same thing for relativity. Relativity, remember. Relativity holds that space-time, what is the definition of space-time? It's uh, the aggregate of events. What's an event? A point in space-time. So if you take all these points, all these happenings, all these occurrences, uh, that is space-time. And it's just a point here and there. So you're having, what are those points? Particles. That's what they mean by that. But they don't call it particle because what that's taboo as well. You can't call it the ether. But here it is, folks. There you have it. You have all these particles coming in from the void, from the dark, uh, you know, energy out there, I guess. And it's popping in and out of existence constantly. That's, that's the ether of today. It's a little different than the ether, than the more rational ether that these other people had in the sense that they said, look, it's a sandbox. And the other guy says, no, it's an ocean. These guys say, no, it's even worse than that. The particles are appearing from nowhere. We have God in there, you know, making the, each one of these little particles come in from nowhere. Or maybe it's like this. I mean, this this is another possibility. Uh, here it is. Oh, no. Oh, it's the same one. Okay. Uh, not the one I wanted to show. Anyways, here's, uh, here's the ether of the old days. Okay. That was the ether of the old days. Let's, let's put it here. Ah. Let me get this one. So there you see the two ethers. The ether on the lower right, that's the one that we've had all these hundreds of years. And the ether now is that they appear out of the void from nowhere, okay? And so you take your pick which ether you want. And uh, yeah, uh, what can we say? This is the ether we have uh, after 10,000 years of dealing with the ether. A really 
numbing. <laughs> that all this, uh, all these hundreds of years, thousands of years, they've had this ether, which is just a bunch of particles, and they've just given it pr different properties. That's all they've done with the ether. And yeah, if you have a bunch of particles, that's not a thing. That's not an object. You cannot call that an object because the table is also a bunch of particles, and so is an elephant. So is a tree, a rock. They're all a bunch of particles. They're all atoms. So what we're going to say, oh, what is a rock? A rock is a bunch of particles. And what is a table? A bunch of particles. And a chair is a bunch of particles. My dog is a bunch of particles. No. Then you cannot say that the ether is a bunch of particles and that that is an object. Okay? You can't say, you can't use it like that. Uh, you got to point to it, you know, completely, and it has to have a shape. Then you can say, that's the ether. Then I can point to it. But if you make it infinite, well, there's no object that is infinite, okay? So you better enclose it with something and tell us what's enclosing it also, <laughs> giving it a shape. So again, the, the ether is a problem because if it is a bunch of particles, you got to tell me what the black stuff between the particles is, what separates one particle from the other. And to this day, they have never figured that out because uh, what stumped them is the fact that they could not see or touch whatever this ether thingy is. And that's where we stand today. 